Hey, happy Monday night, CVF peers. Uh, it's uh, Rick Ward here uh, hosting this evening's webcast. Uh, if you are looking for crazy cat videos, you have logged on to the wrong YouTube site. Uh, tonight is about hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to walk us through uh, the next uh, 90 minutes of fun, great information uh, and, uh, and some, some cool collaborative chatter. Um, down in the right-hand corner in your screen, you can open up the chat group. Um, we'd love to hear your comments uh, as things are going on. If there's questions, clarifications, good jokes, uh, throw them in the chat line. Uh, we really want to make this uh, interactive uh, and meeting your needs. Before I jump into introducing uh, the great uh, panel that will be sharing good information tonight, I just want to acknowledge, uh, do uh, an acknowledgement um, of uh, respect for uh, the lands that we work, play, and webcast on. Uh, and in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, uh, we honor and acknowledge Treaty 7 the traditional and ancestral territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Kainai, Pekani, Siksika, as well as the Tsutsina Nation and uh, the Stony Nakoda First Nation. And we acknowledge that this territory is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who have um, uh, who have lived in and cared uh, for these lands uh, for generations before us. We're grateful for the tradition, uh, the traditional knowledge keepers and elders uh, who are still with us today uh, and those who have gone before us. Um, we make this acknowledgement as an act of uh, reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory uh, we reside on uh, or are visiting. Let me give you the lineup for uh, tonight's uh, uh, webcast. And uh, I'm going to start off with uh, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Norm Campbell. Um, uh, we'll just uh, uh, put his smiling face up. And uh, Norm uh, is uh, a professor emeritus. Is that the right word, Norm? Um, who uh, has been a hypertension leader, not just here in Calgary and a key advisor for our hypertension initiative, uh, but really is a world leader uh, in looking at the population management of hypertension. Um, Norm, welcome, uh, and uh, so good that you could join us tonight and all your work on this project. Um, I want to move on to also uh, give a shout out to Janet Reynolds. Uh, Dr. Janet Reynolds, JR, is our, uh, our fearless leader here, the medical director for uh, Crowfoot Village Family Practice. She has lots of other hats, uh, but uh, tonight uh, she's medical directoring. Uh, Corrine Christensen, um, our, um, our head nurse, there's, I, I hope she doesn't get headhunted to this new you know, provincial head nurse job, but uh, for now she's ours. Uh, so Kareen Christensen, uh, our head nurse here, uh, and uh, one of our leaders in the hypertension uh, uh, initiative. Uh, Jennifer Lamb, Jen Lamb, who's uh, one of our all-star pharmacists, uh, who is co-located here at Crowfoot Village Family Practice, um, and uh, uh, officially uh, working with Calgary Foothills PCN, our great partners in providing super uh, health care. Uh, and then uh, moving on to uh, some of the uh, old timers, uh, Dr. Chris Bachmel. Chris, um, you're still young in my eyes, man. Uh, Chris has been uh, a family physician and partner uh, for what, a couple of decades? But right, yeah, here at Crowfoot. Uh, has a bit longer runway, but, uh, and uh, the new kid on the block is uh, Dr. Ian. Uh, who uh, Ian Johnson, who uh, has uh, we had to prompt to get his bed made uh, behind him uh, so that we had, you know, some a uh, uh, little bit of, uh, of uh, sophistication to the webcast. Uh, and Ian is uh, one of our newer physicians uh, and uh, a familiar face for those of you who've seen uh, the webcast in the past. So, hey, um, 
let's uh, let's start off uh, by bringing in uh, Norm Campbell. Uh, so Norm, um, what is the big deal about hypertension, man? Uh, I know it's been a focus uh, for most of your professional career, but uh, tell us why we should be concerned about hypertension. Well, it, it's all about uh, bl uh, blood pressure, Rick. Uh, 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 blood pressure is the force that uh, provides food and oxygen to all the cells in the body. And, uh, you know, when humans evolved, blood pressure was fairly low and it didn't increase with age. Uh, but as we become unhealthier, uh, the blood pressure is increased and that causes damage to the blood vessels as it goes up. And at a certain point, uh, we call it clinical hypertension and we start to treat it. But uh, currently about one in five deaths in the world are caused by increased blood pressure or close to 11 million people a year. So that's more than twice what COVID did. So Norm, um, what is the likelihood of somebody eventually getting high blood pressure, developing clinical hypertension? Well, as I say, when we uh, uh, first evolved and ate unprocessed foods, exercised and were lean and didn't have a lot of alcohol around, it would have been about zero. Uh, right now, it's about 90% uh, that if a Canadian lives an average lifespan, they'll develop hypertension. So what I hear you saying then is, is that nine out of 10 of us uh, will develop hypertension at some point in their lives. Unless a bus runs you over early. <laughs> well, we won't use that as a default, but no. uh, yeah. And how do, in populations, um, is blood pressure generally well controlled? Uh, uh, across the world, uh, uh, hypertension control is desperately uh, poor. Uh, Canada is one of the leaders, uh, but uh, uh, there are global best practices, which you're taking up here at Crowfoot, but the rest of Canada isn't. And uh, many countries in the world are taking up these global best practice and they will uh, exceed Canada's control rate, but it's, it's quite poor around the world. And it certainly can be improved in Canada. Well, and that's, uh, that's, that's what we're aiming for. And uh, we'll get to JR uh, in a couple of minutes just to, to help uh, punctuate that. Um, but what I heard you say was, is that if you look at the millennium of time, which is even before I was born, right? Like it goes back that far. Um, would you, you said that hypertension probably didn't exist back then, but does now because of the environment. So is it possible if people work hard enough with their diet and their lifestyle um, that they can always treat their blood pressure by lifestyle or at some point um, are many of those nine and 10 people are gonna to need to be on therapies to reduce their blood pressure? Yeah, about 80% of uh, high blood pressure is caused by an unhealthy diet. Uh, but the problem is really the processing of foods, uh, putting in sodium, uh, taking uh, too much saturated fats, sugars, causing obesity, a whole pile of uh, problems. It's very, very difficult for an individual in our society to uh, eat an unprocessed food uh, uh, diet that would be healthy for them. And so uh, technically, it's uh, possible, uh, but uh, uh, it's really uncommon. And most Canadians don't recognize that they eat unhealthy, but uh, the, the, the foods that are out there for us to choose from are nearly all quite unhealthy. And why do they taste so good? But I guess that's an unanswered question. I mean, <laughs> That's true about a lot of life. <laughs> that's true. Hey, let me, uh, let me uh, move over to, uh, to uh, Janet and, and uh, Norm will be coming back to you for sure through this. So JR, I guess, uh, you know, Norm's shared that uh, uh, nine out of 10 people are gonna develop high blood pressure at some point uh, in their journey of life. Uh, but, you know, isn't CVFP doing a pretty good job of helping patients manage blood pressure? I mean, um, you know, why the webinar, why the initiative that they're gonna talk about uh, through the night? Oh, it's such a good question, Rick, because you wanted us to do a big project on high blood pressure. That's why we're doing this. Um, I think it's a big, wicked problem, and we think we're doing a good job, but we're probably not doing the good job that we think we are. So we have an opportunity. Um, Crowfoot is a large clinic with over 24,000 patients, I think. So that means a lot of them 
have or will develop high blood pressure. And um, if we could um, be a little bit better at standardizing our approach, we will, I think, improve a lot more people's health outcomes. Um, the, the couple of big things that we're looking at, Rick, are the paradigm shifts or the mental models around high blood pressure and those amazing office readings uh, after you've argued with the parking machine downstairs and ran up the stairs because you're late and then been upset at me because I'm already behind. And then the nurse runs in and checks your blood pressure that, you know, the accuracy of those office readings and maybe shifting more towards community or home blood pressure monitoring. We're going to hear about that tonight, I think. Um, we have uh, two other team members here, uh, our nurse and our pharmacist, and maybe looking at how we manage these conditions around across the team, not just you and your family physician as uh, the people that are in control of your blood pressure. Um, I think we really do want people to know their numbers. So be, having this sort of public service announcement around how important it is for all adults, maybe over the age of 18, um, to, to know their number and what their number should be. Um, and lastly, the role of blood pressure in those other uh, causes of death that Norm was talking about, what it means for your heart or blood vessel risk. Uh, and one of those things we can modify and treat. We have lots of really good treatments, so why not use them? Yeah, great, uh, great point. And um, uh, Cindy um, online uh, has uh, uh, alluded to one of your points about, um, hey, um, uh, I'm being, I'm anxious and uh, stressed, or when I'm anxious and stressed, uh, that's a big cause of high blood pressure. Um, and it's a nice sort of um, gateway into uh, me posing to Norm, um, the question about the value of home blood pressure readings. Uh, and um, as Janet alluded to, the phenomena that after um, trying to find a parking spot, trying to register for parking, boy, why is your blood pressure high? Um, Norm, is home blood pressure the best and, and should we'd be encouraging patients to take blood pressures at home. And uh, just need to come off mute uh, for that one. Thank, thanks so much, Rick. Uh, I, uh, some people want me muted all the time, but uh, uh, I'm a big, big fan of uh, home blood pressure monitoring. It's, it's one of the great ways uh, to be empowered in your own care. Uh, I'm a patient at the clinic and uh, I have normal blood pressure, but I have a blood pressure device at home and periodically uh, uh, check uh, my pressures. Uh, the home blood pressure is better at telling uh, the damage being done to your blood vessels than an office blood pressure. And uh, it's much more reliable at telling whether you have hypertension or normal blood pressure than the clinic reading. Uh, there's also uh, different sorts of people around. And some people, uh, their blood pressure is only high in the clinic office, but it's normal when they're assessed outside of the office and they're not at really increased risk. And some people are the office, uh, opposite. Uh, they have normal blood pressure in the office, uh, but their blood pressure is high when they're outside and they're at increased risk and uh, they may well uh, need treatment. Uh, people who measure their blood pressure at home uh, uh, automatically get more engaged. They can tell if the treatment's working. And uh, in trials, they take their medications more faithfully. And as a result, uh, their blood pressures are lower and they need uh, less medication. Uh, everyone needs to know every time your heart pumps, uh, a different blood pressure comes out. And uh, that's the way we're all born. And uh, uh, it's designed that way. So if you need higher pressures and more blood in different parts of the body uh, due to stress, pain, physical or emotional stress, uh, your heart responds to that and your blood pressure goes up. And that's the way we're all built. Uh, and that's a normal and a good thing. But when you're rested quietly and comfortably and measuring your blood pressure properly, uh, it still will have some variation, but less variation. And that's where we can tell what your uh, risk is. Um, I'm going to come back in, Norm, but I'm going to uh, ask a, a, a question of uh, the wise young uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, so, Ian, here's a scenario that I see not infrequently. Um, 
uh, a patient will uh, be feeling unwell uh, either with physical symptoms of pain or um, uh, they've been stressed out or they're you know, cheering for the flames, uh, the pre-playoffs, uh, they'll say, I don't feel very well. Uh, they check their blood pressure and they say, holy smokes, uh, it's, uh, it's 140 over 90. It's never this high. Let me check it again. Wow, now it's 160 over 95. Uh, and we get the call when it's, uh, when it's um, you know, 170 over 100. Um, so Ian, do you see that scenario um, uh, in your team? And, and um, what's your response uh, to, to patients uh, that are in that spiral? Yeah, yeah, I reckon it's a good question. I'd, I'd say probably every week we will get someone phoning in like that. Um, and I often comment that, you know, if you walk around the emergency department at Foothills and check everyone's blood pressure, they're all high because they're all there for something else. Um, and much as I, if I say, I don't care, I do, I do care, but it's, it's not important when when you're unwell to have that high blood pressure it's more about the uh, the long game the weather and the climate if you have a bad weather day doesn't matter put up an umbrella time the climate's bad it's time to move to arizona great uh, great um uk analogy with the uh, with the weather I, I like that um so norm just to go back to you, your point then uh i i think there's you know, some symmetry between what you're saying. And that is, is that blood pressures are meant to vary uh, and that when we're sick or unwell, uh, either chronically uh, or acutely, the, the blood pressure going up is, is something that's physiological, but it's that sustained at rest, relaxing blood pressure that we're worried about and we focus on the most. Am I capturing it? Uh, you're capturing that uh, beautifully, uh, Rick. And in fact, uh, there are devices that will measure blood pressure for 24 hours. And the sleep blood pressure is uh, the most, uh, has the greatest ability to predict uh, outcomes, i.e. a yeah. very rested blood pressure. Yeah. And, and Cindy on the, the chat uh, has, uh, has really captured that, that a high blood pressure uh, at home can be scary. Um, and that seems to be elevating it. And, and, uh, certainly an experience of, of anxiety. So I'm going to uh, pick up on another comment in the chat, Norm. Um, can anxiety or being stressed alone be a cause of high blood pressure? It, it, it can be, but it's very unusual situations, such as after major earthquakes or uh, uh, catastrophic wars, uh, population blood pressure uh, uh, goes up. Uh, so chronic stress could, but it, it's uh, more of an acute uh, problem where someone who's highly stressed measures their blood pressure and, and gets a very high reading. That's just the way we were built. And when those uh, stressors, be they pain or mental, uh, go away, uh, the blood pressure comes down. And, and that's really, it's those longer term increases in blood pressures that damage the blood vessels and, and cause the heart attacks and strokes and kidney damage. So uh, having teenagers uh, is not necessarily a cause of, of high blood pressure uh, or of hypertension, although it may cause high blood pressure at times. Absolutely. Good. Well, listen, one of the themes that we've uh, talked about uh, is uh, patients uh, doing some work in measuring blood pressures at home. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to call on uh, Corrine Christensen, uh, our, uh, our head nurse for uh, Crowfoot, um, to talk a little bit uh, about, you know, you know, isn't this our work? Why should patients be measuring their blood pressure? And Kareen, if you're thanks, on mute, Rick. just, yeah. Thanks. There we go. Yeah, thanks for that, Rick. Um, yeah, so I think if we're looking at home blood pressure monitoring or any type of, uh, you know, conditions that we're working with patients on, I think when you get down to it, 
in general, even outside of our health, if we know the why of why we're doing something, um, that's going to lead to better engagement, better understanding from people. Um, you know, people in general, we can just feel more agreeable moving forward with things if we understand not just what we're supposed to do, but why we're doing it. Um, definitely a parenting approach. Preschool, I don't know, do preschoolers, having preschoolers in your house, does that predispose you to high blood pressure too? Or is it just teenagers? I don't know. So I feel like parenting techniques sometimes are across the board, something that can help us. But uh, yeah, I think when we think of, uh, you know, having our patients sort of engaged in that process and that idea of self-management, um, you know, again, we want them to know the why. So, you know, by understanding your condition, how to manage it, feeling like you're a part of it and you're participating in it, um, people can feel more of a sense of control. I think when you feel like something's happening to you or you're having things done for you or to you, um, you really lose that sense of control. And I think with condi any conditions, but I think especially something that you may not even have symptoms um, where you say, well, I feel fine. And, and so, but I'm being told to do this or take this or stop doing this, um, you know, really understanding that why can be, you know, a big piece to the puzzle. So, you know, I think first is that understanding and that can come with, you know, different types of patient education. And then we, when we look at self-management, you know, we really want people to feel like they're part of a team. So we've talked about that before, you know, that, that we are part of the team with them, you know, we're doing things together, that kind of concept of patient partnered care. Um, we really want people to feel empowered to ask questions and participate in that shared decision making. And so Norm made some great points about how monitoring blood pressure at home and being aware of what is our blood pressure? What, it, what do we expect our blood pressure to do? What is a normal response? What is resting? You know, the, that's where that whole kind of concept of home blood pressure comes in. So I think, um, you know, when you're at home, you can somewhat control the conditions differently than when you're out in public. So Norm, you had mentioned, you know, sometimes people's blood pressure is really high when they're in the doctor's office. And I think I remember seeing studies have shown that even patients that don't report that they're feeling stressed or anxious or nervous, um, even if they don't report feeling those feelings, their blood pressure still measures higher just as a result of being out or being in front of somebody versus being at home. So I think being at home, you really get to have that relaxed type of situation, maybe. <laughs> and hopefully you can create the conditions of relaxation to do your blood pressure measurements. Um, you know, you can make sure that you're taking it properly. Again, sometimes in a busy clinic, you know, we're working with different barriers in the office or time, you know, wanting to really kind of maximize what you're, you know, being seen for. You know, we may not have that time to, to sit for five or 10 minutes before we take our blood pressure. You don't have the best ergonomics for taking it where your arm is resting at heart rate and a bunch of these other, or at your heart level, a bunch of these things that, you know, we talk about being important when we're taking our blood pressure. So I think your, your state of your blood pressure at home is really a great reflection if it's being taken you know, properly. And, and we're here to help with that. So that can be part of it is I think understanding, you know, kind of what's, what's going on with that. Um, also, if you look at then the combination of having some blood pressures in hot in office, and then home, you get a better, you know, idea of the full picture. So we can rule out, you know, changes between the two as being the reason why we're seeing some high and some not. So um, as part of our hypertension initiative, which I'm sure, um, you know, you'd be talking um, on more, Rick, that is also included, or one of the first priorities that we looked at is we need to develop, you know, a patient screening guide with information where we can have written information, links to videos and, you know, education material on how do we measure blood pressure at home? What does that look like? What is blood pressure really drilling that down for everybody? So, um, you know, people can then send those readings into us and send those questions into us, whether you're part of our Bright Squid Secure Health you know, email uh, messaging service or whether telephone works better for you. You know, there's a variety of team members that can then follow up with you on those readings and go from there. Hey, Karine, that's great. And I just want to um, uh, just want to uh, pick up on on uh, your point about uh, what it takes to do a proper blood pressure reading at home uh, and also maybe why the office is not the best place to get a good blood pressure. Um, I'm gonna bring in Jen Lam, our uh, pharmacist extraordinaire who uh, spends lots of time um, helping patients with their chronic diseases. Um, Jen, um, 
uh, can you just sort of give a few highlights in terms of what's important uh, or how to manage blood pressure properly? What are some of the factors that, that you should think about uh, to get a, uh, an accurate blood pressure? Uh, I don't think I told you I was going to ask you this question, but I needed to raise your blood pressure a little bit just to see whether this really works. Jen? Yeah, uh, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, factors that uh, make for a good blood pressure would be, as Corinne had alluded to, um, having the proper setting to do it in, um, being relaxed, but also having the proper machine to do it with. Um, and so I, you've walked in the drugstore and there's a myriad of price ranges and um, gizmos and bells and whistles. What do you choose? Um, and so our, our role in the clinic can also be help you, helping you choose the proper uh, machine uh, that's suitable for you and need not be the most expensive one. Um, I often refer people to Costco for theirs. Um, they have a good return policy if you get a lemon. Um, but um, I guess navigating what kind of machine to use. Does the cuff fit? What is a proper fit of the cuff? Because your, your machine's a Cadillac, but your cuff is wrong. Still not great um, readings. Um, and, then, and then periodically checking uh, if your monitor is still working. So um, batteries, do you plug it in? Um, does it get moved around a lot in your house? And so getting it banged around and also change how valid and accurate your machine is. So, uh, so in addition to conditions that Corinne talked about, I think uh, accuracy of machine, type of machine, the fit of the machine uh, for you is also important things to consider. And then there's those um, sort of sedentary points about, uh, um, you know, seated comfortably for five minutes uh, with your feet um, um, supported on the ground, your arm at the right level, uh, not, you know, having an empty bladder, um, not talking before blood pressure. So, so when you think about trying to take an accurate blood pressure, the office is absolutely the worst thing because what happens, you're rushed back, you hop up, um, uh, you know, you've got the nurse grabbing your arm and checking your pressure. Oh, how are you today? Uh, and nobody says, before I check your blood pressure, have you peed in the last hour? I mean, we don't do that. So probably better, eh, to have uh, those conditions that we know are important uh, for accurate blood pressure when you do them in the comfort of your own home. Yeah, so, correct. Yeah. Jen, you're also um, uh, managing patients um, who have been identified with high blood pressure and, of course, lots of diabetes and other things. So um, tell me a little bit about the approach that you'll take from a medication perspective um, uh, when patients do have hypertension and require treatment. Mm -hmm. So generally in our visits, um, there, we have a bit more time than uh, luxury that it, than the dogs do with our patients. And so that affords us a bit more um, kind of deep diving to what's working and what's not working for the patient. Um, so whether you're coming in with already on a blood pressure medication or um, looking to start one, usually we'll go over, you know, personal factors that um, are impacting your choices. So um, we'll usually go through things about non-drug measures first. So lifestyle measures, um, your diet, your stress, caffeine levels, exercise, all those things can impact uh, your blood pressure. Um, and seeing if we can optimize those things first, you know, in conjunction with meds or right or, or, you know, apart from meds. And some patients might not need them if we optimize those lifestyle measures. Um, and then, of course, reviewing their, your blood pressures with you in clinic, uh, checking your machine, and then um, discussing uh, medications and um, what questions um, one might have about your medications. Yeah, that's great. Now, as part of our hypertension initiative, uh, is there going to be some sort of um, protocol or some um, process to choose um, the pharmacotherapy if it's indicated? Yeah, yeah. So in this initiative, um, we are starting. What we we're using what's called a protocol-based therapy, um, and it means choosing therapies that are evidence-based and sequential. So our protocol for this initiative is based on international evidence from um, similar initiatives that have been um, used around the globe uh, with good effect, um, and also in consultation with our hypertension expert, Dr. Campbell. 
Um, so basically treatment between patients will look pretty much the same if there are no compelling reasons otherwise that we need to change or modify it. So um, those reasons might be age or frailty, uh, lab work coming back that indicates we need to change something. Um, but otherwise uh, it's sequential and evidence-based. Um, so Norma, I'm going to bring you back into the uh, conversation here. Uh, there's been some uh, great discussion on the chat line, um, both between speakers and also uh, between uh, our participants around uh, how do you choose a good blood pressure um, monitor. Um, and uh, there was some comments about uh, hypertension.ca uh, uh, as being a good web resource. How do you go about uh, shopping for a good blood pressure monitor, notwithstanding uh, uh, Jen's excellent advice about uh, going to a place that has a good return policy? Uh, uh, that's a, a great question, Rick. And so uh, one of the things is to get an automated device, and they can be uh, semi-automated where you uh, pump them up by hand or fully automated where you push a button and it pumps up itself. Uh, but it's really important uh, that in uh, Canada, uh, the regulations require them to be certified that they do not electrocute you. Uh, they are not certified in a fashion that says that they're accurate. Uh, and uh, so that's a real problem. Uh, the vast majority of devices sold in Canada have not been tested for accuracy or have failed accuracy standards. And so uh, uh, it's a really a consumer beware situation. Uh, Hypertension Canada, hypertension.ca, uh, indicates uh, the devices that have been validated for accuracy on their website. Quite important uh, uh, to get one of those as opposed to uh, just online uh, purchasing uh, one or or just go going to a store. Uh, the Hypertension Canada also has a little uh, logo that you can look up on their website that identifies uh, the accurate devices. Uh, this is a global problem. Some countries are tackling it and some like Canada aren't. And so there's a few of us that are agitating for change. Uh, I, I think uh, Jennifer really mentioned the, the 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 critical importance of a right cuff size, and uh, don't purchase even an accuracy validated one unless you can be sure that it's the the right cuff for you. Um, it's a great uh, great comments, Norm. Um, so those cool little ones that you stick on your finger, those blood pressure monitors, or I'm sure there's an app or an Apple Watch thing for this, um, may not be accurate and give good information. Uh, they're, they're strongly recommended not to be used for clinical purposes, i.e., uh, you know, for determining if you have high blood pressure or for monitoring your treatment. Uh, I think they're a good amusement uh, for people who like to be amused by uh, those types of things. Uh, there are um, uh, some for the wrist uh, that are uh, uh, accuracy validated, uh, but they're very sensitive to the arm position. And so they're generally reserved for people whose arm is shaped in a fashion that uh, cannot fit a, an upper arm cuff. Uh, and so uh, the, the recommendation is uh, very unusual shaped arms where it can't be measured on the upper arm. Uh, these validate wrist ones uh, can be used with a fair bit of caution. Okay, so um, Corrine, let me paint you the scenario. Um, my kids say, what the heck am I going to get dad for Father's Day? The buggers got everything. They're watching this webcast and they say, I bet he does not have a home blood pressure monitor. So I open up on Sunday morning, instead of socks or underwear, I get a home blood pressure monitor. I'm thinking, hmm. Did they invest in like the really good kind? H how do I get this validated? Can Crowfoot help with that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, first thing could be, you know, checking the hypertension.ca. Ideally, the, your wonderful loved one who gave it to you would have done that ahead of time, but you could double check that that machine is in fact one that's validated through Hypertension Canada. 
Um, looking at the machine's instructions, I think as um, Jen and Dr. Campbell have referred to for the cuff size, usually there's a measurement um, piece to that. Um, but yes, our registered nurse team here uh, is fully uh, able and ready to help out um, with looking at machines, whether it's learning how to use a new one um, and bringing you know, machines in to have them checked. So um, as far as I'm aware of, outside of perhaps um, some medical reprocessing companies that do actual um, electronic diagnostic tests on machines, we can't, there isn't a, an electronic validation um, tool that we can use for blood pressure machines. But what we can do is compare them against an office standardized electronic machine readings back to back to check and see are they similar or is there a big difference. So that's when we know we can at least be in the ballpark. So um, patients are more than welcome to call their team at any time, their, their health team, um, and they can set up an appointment with the uh, with our triage nurse or with their team nurse. Um, we can take a look at the machine together, um, check and make sure that it fits properly, um, measure it against our office machine and um, answer any questions that they have. And usually we say, you know, if people are coming in for a routine appointment, checking in on health screening or, or if they're following up on their blood pressure, bring your machine with you to the appointment. Because again, even if we're not checking your blood pressure from a screening perspective and that you're not resting, maybe you have other circumstances and we're not measuring your blood pressure for your treatment plan, but we can do a quick check your machine against our machine to make sure are they making sense. And generally we say, if the readings are more than five to 10 off, then that's probably not working in the way it should. Great, and I'm gonna bring uh, Jen Lamb back again. Jen, uh, you're getting props in the uh, chat from uh, your patient, Keith. Uh, who uh, says uh, that uh, uh, he's he's got regular dates with you and you've got uh, his blood pressure under good control. So same thing, same question to you about validating uh, blood pressure machines. Uh, can a community pharmacist help with that? I mean, if uh, I get my... Uh, uh, open my package on uh, Sunday and I can't wait to till CVFP opens on Monday. Can I go to my community pharmacist and get them to help with that validation piece? Yeah, I, I don't see why not. And um, uh, from the ones that, that I previously worked at, I think we lack, this is a couple of years back now, um, uh, uh, like Corinne mentioned, an a, a, a office standardized machine um, in the community pharmacies themselves, but some of them now are, are outfitted well and uh, have good clinical services and could possibly do that for you if you bring it in. Um, they also have, some of them have the big um, industrial style ones. Um, and and uh, as, when I remember working for them uh, years ago, they would often bring in uh, standardized technicians to come and periodically standardize them. So uh, in short, yes, probably they can. Uh, just call ahead to make sure that they have time in the space uh, for you to do so. Great. Um, I want to bring in. Um, uh, I want to bring in uh, Chris uh, Bachmel um, to just uh, give a few words on high blood pressure in the context of all the other cardiovascular health issues. Um, uh, I'm going to um, uh, after. Um, uh, Chris makes a few comments. There's been lots of great questions that have come up uh, on the chat and also questions that have submitted, uh, but be a nice um, segue into that first question. Uh, if Chris, you can talk a little bit about putting high blood pressure or hypertension into the context of cardiovascular health. Sure, thanks Rick, yeah. Um, so really, um, if you imagine cardiovascular health um, as a wheel, uh, high blood pressure, hypertension is, is, is kind of one of the spokes of that. And it's one that um, we've talked about, um, you know, it's something you can do for yourself at home. You can um, invest in your own health and your own understanding. Uh, and high blood pressure is one of those things where you can, you can actually be involved in, in your own health and health care. Um, high blood pressure is one, we call them risk factor. For, um, for cardiovascular disease, there are other ones. Uh, I mean, certainly smoking, diabetes, um, lack of exercise, um, a, a multitude of these. Genetics, to some extent, play into it. Um, cholesterol, we talk about. So this really is, we're focusing on, on the blood pressure today um, because it's one that we can, uh, A, uh, measure fairly readily. You can do it at home. And by managing it by treating it, um, we can have a significant impact on outcomes. And, and so 
Um, that's that's sort of why we're focusing on. But the other things are actually important as well. And and to some extent, um, when we say, well, let's check your blood pressure. Um, yes, we can make a difference to your health just with that. But we're also in the back of our minds kind of thinking, well, okay, what's your blood pressure like? And what about those other things, the cholesterol? Uh, what about diabetes, blood sugars? So it turns out the blood pressure itself, um, and by and large, um, if it's high, you wouldn't really feel. But what you feel are the symptoms from damage to the organs as a result of cardiovascular disease, and whether that's from blood pressure or the other things. And when we talk about the brain, you know, that's things like strokes. And when we talk about the heart, it's things like, like heart attacks, but it's also things like the big blood vessel in your abdomen, the aorta, that can balloon out as a result of the, this cardiovascular disease. Your kidneys can start working less as a result. Um, your muscles in your legs as you're walking up the hill might start screaming at you because um, the, there's not enough blood supply. Um, so cardiovascular health, if we look at it in a broader picture, that's where you start getting sick. That's where you start getting symptoms. Um, and and that's when it starts getting serious in the sense of you actually being unwell. Um, so, so high blood pressure is one of the spokes of that, but it also then reminds us, as it were, to say, well, here's the blood pressure. It on its own, if we treat it, is going to make a difference to you. But what about the other things? And how can we actually improve your health down the road, looking at brain and heart and kidneys and legs and all of it? Um, in, 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 the, in the broader sense. So that's kind of why we do that. Um, there, and so in, in, in that sense, uh, the blood pressure is just one of those factors, but it's one that we can really make a difference with and one that's fairly easily measured. So that's kind of why we, why we focus on that. No, great, uh, great answer, Chris. And I guess what I hear is, is that I, I like that uh, comment about it's uh, high blood pressure, treating hypertension is one of the the spokes and the wheels of cardiovascular health. Uh, just uh, a shout out about uh, cholesterol and statins. Uh, we'll get to a statin question a little bit later, um, but um, uh, uh, Crowfoot will be initiating a, um, a cholesterol management uh, uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, Keith, uh, we'll keep your eye uh, open for that one, looking at maximizing um, uh, cholesterol management in patients who've already had cardiovascular events. So uh, if you're someone who has had um, uh, a cardiovascular event, uh, stroke, heart attack, angina, coronary calcium in your heart arteries, um, uh, we'll be taking a close look at, uh, at your numbers coming up. Um, Dr. Ian, we want to bring you in uh, to, there's been some questions about what about the long-term effects of these uh, medications? Uh, if you've been on uh, a blood pressure medication for 30 years and a cholesterol lowering medication for 20 years, what's all this going to do to your body? What's the long-term effect of all these medications? I think we can comfortably say that all these medications are safe to take and it's the, the effect of the uncontrolled problem that's dangerous. Um, the I, I remember when I was training in cardiology in Glasgow, one of the cardiologists would quite happily have put a torvastatin in the water if he could have got away with it because of the population we were looking after there. That's, that's how safe these medications are because he wasn't some crazy person. These, these are safe medications and... Um, I've got family members taking them. I expect, you know, Norm says 90%. I'm probably going to be taking them myself one day. Um, and I ha quite happily would do. Um, I'm not at the moment. I'm trying to make sure I'm staying as fit and active and watching my diet, but I'm young. And so at some point I probably will need to. And I, I would be quite comfortable taking, taking medications if it was necessary. Yeah, so I'll often say to my patients when asked that question, I say the side effect of being on these medications for a long time is you're going to live longer. Fairly accurate? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way of putting it. Yeah, live longer and also probably more years in better health. Um, I'll share that my brother smoked when we were younger and I remember him used to say, oh, you know, live fast, die young. 
And then I went to medical school and I told them, no, probably more live slowly, die slowly. And I think that's <laughs> the same with a lot of uh, uncontrolled um, health problems and in a way where we can live better quality of life in our later years if we manage some of these risk factors when we're younger. Great. Okay, let's do some rocket uh, questions. Um, Norm Campbell, um, there's the systolic and the diastolic. The systolic is the higher number and the diastolic is the lower number. Um, which one should we be worried about? Uh, I, I think both are important, but the systolic or the top number is uh, the main uh, uh, worry in terms of uh, uh, what's going to happen to you. Uh, some people have even suggested forgetting about the, the bottom or the diastolic number, but especially for younger individuals, that uh, bottom number of diastolic is, is important and can damage your blood vessels as well. Yeah, so that's different, eh, Norm? A um, hundred years ago, when I was in medical school, they used to say, oh, the systolic, you know, you, you know, age plus 30 divided by your shoe size is the normal number. Uh, but that the thinking now is, is that that top number, the systolic, is the one that's most associated with bad outcomes. I, I, absolutely. And I, I think it's something, uh, you know, in, 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 with COVID, people got very concerned as uh, advice changed. Uh, in the field of hypertension, it does change as well, but uh, typically over time periods of five, 10, uh, or even longer years. And it's really based on new research that tells us uh, how to better treat uh, uh, people. And so uh, at one time, people ignored the top number. Now we know it's the most important number uh, to treat and, and control. And there's other little nuances that change with time. We tend to treat people with lower uh, blood pressure these days than we used to as well. And that's really because we have strong evidence that can prevent their death, their strokes, heart failure, heart attacks, and, and, and things. And so many more people are being advantaged now than, than were in the dark days when we trained. Um, well, hey, it just occurred to me as we're talking, I don't think we've talked numbers at all here. So Norm, what, uh, what's uh, a, a normal blood pressure or what blood pressure um, would, you, um, um, would you like that would, uh, should patients strive for? Yeah, and so uh, a great question, uh, Rick. And uh, again, uh, we were designed to have low blood pressure uh, for, throughout our lives. And so as we changed our society, uh, uh, blood pressure has increased with age. And so an optimum blood pressure is less than 120, 80. And as your blood pressure goes up, uh, even above 115, uh, 75, uh, there's increasing damage to your blood vessels. Uh, what we call hypertension is really where we have evidence that drug treatment will benefit you. And so uh, if people have diabetes or kidney disease or other uh, substantive risks, uh, we call them hypertensive above 130 on 80 millimeters mercury, whereas uh, individuals that, uh, uh, without other risk factors, uh, we would call hypertension 140 on 90 or above. And so uh, before I uh, flip over to uh, Jen to ask about the impact of, of weight and obesity on uh, blood pressure, um, Norm, can, can a blood pressure be too low? Um, you know, uh, particularly my adolescent female patients, uh, they come in and their blood pressure may be 100 over 60 or 100 over 50. Should we be worried about that? Uh, we should, especially if they're irritating, because they'll live a long time. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the, uh, the the lower your blood pressures are, as long as they're not caused by a disease like blood loss or uh, some other diseases that can impact uh, your blood pressure, your blood vessels become happier and happier. And uh, it's your blood vessels that really usually determine uh, whether you're going to have a disability or, or death uh, prematurely. Yeah, in fact, I recall a, uh, a wise uh, blood pressure specialist once said to me, the best blood pressure to have is one millimeter of mercury above that at which you feel dizzy if you stand up quickly. Uh, does that wisdom still apply? I, 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 think, I think that applies. And I, I, st I do get a little dizzy when I stand up and I'm okay with that. I'll, <laughs> I'll handle that as, as long as you're not uh, uh, fainting and it's not caused by disease. It's usually a good thing. And 
often the cardiologists, if you have heart disease, uh, they'll be running your blood pressures really pretty low as long as you're not uh, passing out. Well, look, let's continue on that theme around low blood pressure and specifically the impact of losing weight. Uh, Jen um, I. Thompson uh, has uh, asked about um, what impact does weight loss have on blood pressure? Uh, well, in general, uh, weight loss, you also get a decrease in blood pressure. Um, so the quick answer is yes. The question that usually follows people I'll ask is, well, how much can I expect? Um, and, and the answer is always depends. Um, and it depends on things like your family history, your genetics, what your starting weight is, um, and other personal factors. But on average, you can probably expect for every estimated nine or so pounds of weight loss um, to get a, about a six point decrease in your systolic blood pressure and a four point decrease in your diastolic or, or lower number of blood pressure. Um, and then if you combine it with exercise, about 30 minutes or so a day of aerobic exercise, um, you get even better results. So, so yes, weight affects blood pressure, combine it with exercise, you get even better blood pressure. Yeah, I remember my, uh, um, my colleague, uh, our colleague, uh, David Lau, uh, would say that a five to 10% uh, drop in your weight uh, is almost like the equivalent of, of starting a blood pressure medication uh, it has that similar kind of effect. Um, just want to spend a minute on uh, Ozempic uh, and Jen again, uh, uh, an unrehearsed question just to put you on the spot. Um, you know, next to cat videos on TikTok, I think Ozempic stories are, uh, are uh, raging number two. Because it came up, what the heck is Ozempic uh, and uh, why might you want to use it for something like weight loss? Yeah, so besides being educated from TikTok, <laughs> Ozempic is, um, well, it was a diabetes medication to begin with, and it was used to um, improve blood sugars of diabetic patients. And in the course of doing so, um, we've noticed uh, a, a large weight decrease that comes alongside it. And so um, now Ozempic has probably been rebranded. It has been rebranded as a weight loss medication, um, but it still goes by People know it as its most popular name, Ozempic. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's used for diabetes classically, but now um, also has indication from Health Canada as a weight loss uh, agent. Yeah, and I wanted to bring that up again, just for a, a really practical piece. Um, uh, my mom, hi mom, I told you that I was gonna mention you online here. Uh, my mom who has diabetes uh, and had a little bit extra weight started it on, on Ozempic had great um, blood sugar control, lost a bunch of weight. Uh, but guess what? Now when she stands up, she's getting dizzy. Um, so what should she be thinking about in terms of her blood pressure medications? Mm -hmm. I think first off measure and, and, and know what your blood pressure is. Um, and then if it is uh, low and you're symptomatic um, or just worrisome, talk to your health team, uh, call us, um, schedule an appointment, a virtual visit, what have you. Um, let's talk about it. Um, great advice. Uh, I wanna go back to um, this whole concept of patient self-monitoring for blood pressure. And um, maybe Trevor, I'll just get you to flip up uh, the draft of our patient um, handout that we're going to be drafting and uh, a shout out to Patricia, who is our uh, communications and patient engagement specialist here at Crowfoot. Um, she's put together uh, the first draft of uh, a handout that we're going to be using quite extensively um, at Crowfoot uh, to encourage people to find out what their blood pressure is, to look at it in the context of their heart health, um, uh, and also to take steps to reduce. And Trev, just um, sort of uh, scroll down to the, uh, on that, to uh, the um, pictorial on how to take blood pressure, the uh, steps that you need to, to take good blood pressure. And um, while people are looking at that visual online, um, Norm, uh, 
you made us aware of um, uh, an actual patient education module and certificate around home blood pressure monitoring. Uh, can you speak to that for a few minutes? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Rick. And I guess uh, the other thing that's very important to note is the uh, definition of hypertension is different when you're home measuring your blood pressure. Uh, the pressures uh, drift lower at home. And so 135 on the top number, 85 on the bottom number at home uh, is consistent with hypertension, a 140, 90 in the clinic. That's important uh, to be aware of. Uh, 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 every the It's very, very important that blood pressures are measured properly. And so an international group uh, led by the World Health Organization branch in the Americas, but with the World Hypertension League and a variety of national organizations, including Hypertension Canada, uh, has developed a online uh, video training course on how to get the right device, how to use it properly, how to record it. Uh, and it comes with a little knowledge test at the end, which if you pass, uh, you get a, a certificate. Uh, it should have been live a while ago, and uh, we're expecting it to go live uh, any day now, which probably in uh, uh, bureaucratic terms means a few weeks. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I certainly, I, I think the clinic could uh, promote this. Uh, it's free and it's uh, online and you would be encouraged to take it periodically to make sure that your uh, techniques and things are, are coming along. Um, great, thanks, Norma. We'll take down that visual um, and uh, I'm gonna keep you on the spot. Uh, my uh, uh, longtime friend, uh, Janet W. Uh, uh, sent in this question. Um, why is it normal to have higher blood pressure in the morning? I understand about adrenaline kicking in at Al. So how long should we wait after waking to get a better picture of whether or not our blood pressure is too high? Should we take it before we eat? Uh, so maybe just uh, some comments on how does blood pressure change through the day and when's the best time of day to be taking your blood pressure? Uh, sure, should I address that, Rick? Yeah, that's okay, Norm. Yeah, okay. I, I, absolutely. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so uh, it is true. Blood pressure uh, changes. Uh, at night, it drops about 10 to 20 percent, and that's considered a, a normal drop. If it doesn't drop at night, that's a bad thing for your uh, uh, blood vessels. Uh, your body pre-prepares itself for getting up and around during the day, and so it sends out a lot of uh, different hormones and signals to wake you up and uh, get you ready. And uh, those signals uh, uh, in part uh, increase your blood pressure. And so we call that the morning surge in, in uh, blood pressure. And it's often a time also when heart attacks and strokes occur because in part of that increase in blood pressure, but also these various uh, different hormones. And so uh, uh, we recommend uh, uh, twice a day blood pressure readings in the morning uh, when you get up before you eat your breakfast. And so you know, you get out of bed, move around, do the different things that you want to do. And then you sit in a quiet, comfortable uh, place, uh, rest for five minutes, and then measure your blood pressure. Uh, 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 readings in that setting will be uh, maybe a couple of millimeters higher than in the evening uh, if you uh, take them, uh, you know, well after uh, dinner, uh, but before you go to sleep. And, uh, 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 but taking them twice a twice a day, two readings each uh, time. Uh, and if you do that for seven days, you get an excellent idea of what your usual blood pressure is. I tried to do it for seven days, but I can't sit still that long. And so I did manage it with a struggle, but uh, uh, three days is not quite as good, but uh, would give you a, a, a reasonable indication of your usual blood pressure. And you will notice periodic changes in the readings. Uh, and we love it with uh, our engineer patients uh, when they come in with those spreadsheets of their blood pressures for the last two decades. It's uh, it's uh, very helpful and uh, very useful for us. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Dr. Bachmel, Chris, uh, there was a question here about have blood pressure medications really changed over time? Uh, are the newer blood pressure medications the better ones? Uh, if I've been on hydrochlorothiazide, a water pill for blood pressure for, um, you know, for 20 years, is it time to, to get a 2.0 version of my blood pressure medication? 
Uh, Chris, uh, what's your wisdom on that? Um, <clears throat> well, I would say, yes, blood pressure pills have changed over time. Um, absolutely so. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm, you know, also showing my experience level. Um, and so when I was training, um, uh, there were some medications that we were using commonly then that are still being used. And uh, so hydrochlorothiazide is the one that uh, pops up a lot and is still absolutely being used. Um, but some of the uh, some of the other medications we're using these days were not around when I trained. Uh, or where just some of the classes were just kind of coming in. Um, so I would say, um, yes, there are new medications on the market. Um, they are not necessarily better, although um, there are a multitude of reasons why uh, either your pharmacist or, or your nurse or your physician might choose um, something slightly different for you rather than what the typical treatment would be. Um, and so there are these sort of individual variations that we want to address. And that's where a lot of those different classes come in. Um, you know, uh, presence of diabetes, for example, or what about have you previously had some heart disease? Um, these things all kind of play into it. Um, are you allergic to something? Uh, could possibly come in as well. Um, and even though these medications are uh, by and large uh, very safe and they make you live longer and they make you live better, individually, um, could you potentially have a side effect or something? Yes. So um, uh, there are differences at the same time. Uh, and uh, there, if you went around a room of physicians, you'd probably get somewhat different opinions. But in general, if you have a medication that works for you, that doesn't make you feel ill from a side effect, and that controls your blood pressure, in my mind, there's not a great reason to change that to something new just because it's new. So the main thing really is like, if your blood pressure is well controlled on a medication you've been on for 30 years and is not causing you any difficulty, uh, any side effects, then staying on that is probably a very reasonable thing to do um, rather than switching. No, so sometimes older is just as good, right? But, but uh, there may be reasons um, with other health conditions coming along that would compel us to change uh, medications. Precisely. Um, and Jen, got some specific medication questions for you. Uh, and uh, this next question, uh, I think, is from Cecile. Um, yeah, about that rotten... No, it wasn't... Anyway, I'll find out who asked the question, but that rotten swelling that I'm getting in my calves since I started my blood pressure uh, medication, what is the most likely class of medications that can cause that and what do I do about it? Um, so usually it makes us think of a class called calcium channel blockers. Um, amlodipine tends to be one of the, the more popular favorites in that group. Um, and what can you do about it? Um, I'd say talk to one of us uh, and just don't go off at cold turkey. Um, call us up and, and we'll have a chat. Yeah, I mean, uh, they told me that I wasn't allowed to show and tell, but uh, I, if any of my patients are online, when they come in with their CCB related leg swelling, I usually pull up my pant leg and pull down my shaw, sock and show them uh, the, the little bit of swelling that I get uh, being on a, a calcium channel blocker. But uh, nobody's looking at my ankle, so uh, uh, I'm able to live with it. Not dangerous, right? But can be bothersome, especially when the weather gets hot and, and there are options. Um, hey, so here's uh, a question, uh, and this one uh, truly was from Cecile. Uh, what is there a best time to take blood pressure medications, morning, night, or does it matter? Um, I think uh, if you ask different practitioners, they'll say different things. But in general, if you take it at the time that works for you and remember it, remember to take it, that's probably the best time for you. So one, does it get in your, in your, in your body? Um, and then about that morning surge that um, Norm talked about, some uh, specialists will say take it in the morning um, to combat that morning surge. Norm, I'll leave that to you to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but um, if you're taking your med, uh, it doesn't matter as long as you're, it's getting in your system. 
I, I don't think I could answer it uh, better. The critical thing is to get the medication in and uh, everyone's a little bit uh, different. And so if there's a best time for you that you can take at the same time every day, uh, that's the right time. And uh, uh, as Jen indicated, people could argue this over, but uh, the right answer is to take the medication same time each day. Yeah, and, and that certainly mirrors what I say to patients, which is the best time to take it is uh, the time that you remember to take it. And, and for me, uh, uh, I follow the advice that I give and have my dosette sitting uh, right next to my toothbrush. And so it's part of my evening routine, not because I think it's the right time, but uh, but even taking one pill a day, OMG, how easy it is to, to forget that. So I think building in that routine is, uh, is really, really important. Um, Norma, I'm going to keep you online uh, with a, a question around, um, and Mark uh, alluded to it. Um, you said earlier that, uh, be, that the long-term implication of high blood pressure uh, is effect on uh, the arteries uh, and the end organs. So you're, you've got your blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure identified and then treated. Um, does that damage get better with blood pressure control over time? Uh, I think that's a fantastic uh, question. Uh, uh, in general, uh, and I think it was Chris who indicated that there's multiple factors that damage your blood vessels if you're smoking, if you're overweight, what your cholesterols are. Uh, if everything is optimally treated, there is some data that your blood vessels can actually improve over time. Uh, but most of the, the things we worry about are things called soft plaques. And when they break in the blood vessels, that's the heart attack and the stroke. And uh, 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 keeping, uh, even if you have damaged blood vessels, uh, keeping those plaques harder, which means you know keeping your cholesterols down, keeping your blood pressures well, keeping your diabetes under control, et cetera, uh, then the risk is markedly lower. Uh, I think the great news about blood pressure is that uh, your risk goes down as soon as your blood pressure goes down. It doesn't take a long time for uh, you to see the benefits. And so uh, uh, you bring your blood pressure down, uh, you'll have reductions in your risk of heart attack, stroke, heart failure right away. Um, yeah, so that's great to know. And of course, um, uh, when you're talking plaque stabilization, um, uh, the, the cholesterol geek online, which would be me, uh, also points to uh, the great evidence for statins, Lipitor, Crestor, Atorvastatin, Simvastatin, um, uh, really have a very powerful effect. Um, uh, and again, um, uh, Ian, uh, just to bring back another question, um, is it okay to take a cholesterol lowering medication and a blood pressure medication together? Uh, and is that an exception or is it a rule? Yeah, so I think this is, uh, I heard someone say a second ago something about older being better. Um, I, I'm not sure I agree with that, Chris and Rick, but we're all, uh, we're all, we're all learning. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I sometimes say to patients when I'm talking to them about statins and whether they should take one um, is, you know, perhaps this is a patient taking no medications. Um, I talk about the cardiac cocktail. So that's what happens when you have a heart attack and you, the cardiologist will put you on five things when you leave the hospital. So in terms of prevention, we could take one or two things today and not take five and not have a heart attack and all of the potential problems in terms of our overall well-being that that could have so yeah there's there's no interactions between uh, the likes of a statin or an angiotensin receptor blockers hydrocortisone any of these commonly used medications that we're using for cardiovascular risk reduction um so it's really just choosing the right right combination and uh, we've had some really long and quite interesting conversations with norm about you know what should we choose um and for our patients listening, can you be surprised that 20 physicians can't all agree on something? So um, it has been quite a, a quite a deep conversation to try and work out what's the what's going to be the, the, the best. And I think probably the thing I learned through this process, um, oh, damn, older is not, older is better, um, is that it's getting, it's getting that control 
um, as opposed to how you get that control. So yeah, if like uh, Chris kind of spoke to this earlier, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if we've got you on a regimen of medications um, for your blood pressure and your cholesterol and these um, parameters are well controlled, we're great. Uh, if you're new to the game and we've just identified that your blood pressure is uh, is high, then we've got a, a very sensible um, uh, collection of medications that we would look at to begin with. But again, just tailoring it between ourselves and the pharmacy team to to get you onto the right the right cocktail to avoid the cardiac cocktail. Right on. So uh, before I uh, do a round table and uh, just um, ask uh, all of our uh, panelists uh, for one key message they would like to leave, uh, our web mistress, um, is that the right term, web mistress? It sounds vaguely wrong. But anyway, our web mistress says, I'll read this, remember to like and subscribe. And I think that button is like down at the bottom, right, Meredith? Yes. If you like and subscribe, uh, we will be on your feed every, no, we won't be on your feed every day. But uh, when you do that, then the next time we have one of these events, you will be yep. notified and you'll know even earlier. And you get a 10% discount. No, no 10% discount. Okay. Uh, so uh, like and subscribe uh, to hear more of this. Uh, okay, before we go into silly land, 100%, uh, why don't we just uh, go around the table and uh, one key message that you would like our participants to walk away from tonight. Um, Nurse Corrine. Thanks, Rick. Um, I would say key message is for me, we're here to we're here to work with you. We're here to work together. Um, it can seem very overwhelming. Um, the thought of needing to make or wanting to make all sorts of different changes and being told or you know that we need to to make a plan. And I would say, you know, we're here to help support you. And that um, you know, small measurable steps, you know, that you can take one thing at a time um, will you know can can really help when we're trying to frame our mind of. Of change or of trying to, you know, look at things in a different way. So I would say, yeah, we're here to support you and it's, you know, one step at a time. Great. Thanks, Kareem. Dr. Bucknell, Chris, um, a wisdom from the wise. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, th stuff can happen, but in general, um, if we can prevent um, chronic illness, you can indeed live longer. And as Ian has also said, you can live better for longer. And there's lots of evidence for that. And uh, one of the uh, key factors in that uh, is maybe the majority actually would be cardiovascular health and blood pressure is um, one of those spokes that we can easily get a handle on in the sense of measurement, um, in the sense of having a sense of having a, an, an ownership uh, an involvement and interest in your own health um, and we can treat it and we can make a difference uh, as Norm said right away. Um, there are other spokes as well, but um, just by figuring out this one uh, one factor, uh, yeah, we can really make a difference um, and working together uh, is more effective in trying to do it on your own. So ask for help, you bet. Thanks. And uh, Jen, the pharmacist. Uh, your thoughts as we finish off the evening. Um, they say the best time to plant a tree is about 20 years ago. And, and I think the same goes for vascular health, uh, that the best time to treat is probably a way long time ago. So why not now? And the time is up at the essence. So I'd say, um, talk to us and, and measure your blood pressure, see what it is. That is like a very green comment. I love it. That's a love that analogy. Um, Ian, your thoughts as we finish. Yeah, you know what? The, the biggest killer of Canadians is still cardiovascular disease. The biggest cause of illness in Canada is still cardiovascular disease. Um, and I think that knowing that we can empower our patients to treat to check their blood pressure at home they live at home it's a more reliable and reproducible and accurate measurement and then working 
partnering with the rest of our health team to keep that blood pressure just in that sweet spot where you're not going to end up developing those diseases that you can prevent is probably more bang for your buck than a lot of the other preventive maneuvers that we'll talk about uh, from time to time or occasionally patients will come in and ask us about some of these things don't have anywhere near the sorts of evidence of what we're talking about tonight this is the big this is it this is where most of our our bang for our buck is and you don't even need to come into the clinic to do it well yeah and i I, not that the other wisdoms weren't great but i want to just pick up on a couple of those and then i've said my wisdoms um this whole concept of partnership in health. Uh, The old day was you come in to see the doctor, the doctor wraps the cuff around and then says, you've got this and and gives you the medication. We're in an era where uh, thankfully we are partners in helping you manage your health. Um, And I think it's just uh, such an important and key message. We haven't spent a lot of time tonight uh, talking about the importance of of, uh, diet, exercise, reducing sodium. Uh, uh, I'm taking away uh, your wisdom there, Norm, Um, uh, but those are so powerful uh, in reducing blood pressure. Um, uh, Fast fact, uh, as uh, any of my patients online know, uh, I've had uh, my ups and downs with weight. Um, When I got started on my blood pressure medication uh, and then got on the program and lost some weight, uh, I was finding standing up and getting dizzy. Uh, Just that 10, 12 pound weight loss that I had uh, was enough for me to have to lower my blood pressure medication. So lifestyle really does work and can't emphasize it enough. Um, Norm Campbell. Sure, uh, probably two comments if I'm allowed. So uh, the first to the general audience is uh, the critical need to know what your blood pressure is. And if it's uh, above the thresholds, uh, make sure that you get it controlled. And so I think that's that's to the audience. and. Uh, the other thing to the audience is is really for the Crowfoot Clinic. Uh, they're establishing a world class program to uh, treat and control hypertension, and uh, that will reduce the uh, rates of death and disability uh, in, in the patients. And uh, to my knowledge, it's the only one in Canada that's taking uh, this on at the current time. And so we're really hoping uh, uh, that other uh, uh, clinics and areas will be inspired by this uh, to. Uh, follow up on this initiative. So congratulations uh, to the clinic. Hey, thanks, Norm. Uh, the uh, the mountain climbers need a Sherpa and, and you've been an incredible guide uh, uh, through this. Uh, and uh, and uh, in that journey, uh, we need uh, uh, an incredible leader. And so JR, as customary, uh, we will give uh, you uh, the last opportunity to share, uh, share uh, the pearls that you'd like to end with. Uh, tonight. Okay, well, thank you, Rick. Um, I don't have, I have more than one. So thank you for your uh, vision and bringing this to Crowfoot and Norm for those comments. So I wanted all the patients online to know we are in development around this process and we will have um, lots of communications coming out. We will be standardizing those patient handouts and this will be, uh, we'll, we're going to start testing it as we go here in the very short term. And this was the first, this kind of webinar for you as an education session is our launch. Um, we have an amazing team. And so I want to highlight that it's not just about you and your physician. We have uh, nurses, lots of them, pharmacists, more than just Jen uh, around to help us with this as well. Um, I hear myself saying a lot, if I could prescribe one thing for the rest of my career for every condition, it would be exercise. But I, after this webinar, might add a blood pressure pill because that will start to work immediately uh, to lower your risk and exercise might take a bit of time. Um, And I wanna also remind all of us that we've had patients, we have patients involved in our initiative as well. So our PEP squad, our patient, engagement partners have been on all of the working groups for this blood pressure initiative that we're doing. And I hope it's not just aspirational, like Norm was saying, that we can spread this to other clinics in Calgary and Alberta. And thank you for joining us tonight.
Yeah, and I'll finish off by uh, adding my thanks uh, and also a shout out to uh, the wizards behind the curtain, uh, uh, webmistress uh, Meredith, uh, as well as uh, Trevor, uh, the man with the technology, and Patricia, who uh, has done incredible work in uh, motivating us, in assisting us, um, in really supporting us, um, hearing the patient voice and including uh, the patient voice in our initiatives. Uh, and of course, thanks to you guys, uh, we tried to work with uh, Weather Canada to uh, have a thunderstorm in the middle of this to punctuate uh, all the important points with uh, uh, thunder and lightning. But you know what they say about the weather. Uh, this will be available on the website. Uh, within the next week or so. So if you want to go back and hear some of the pithy jokes uh, or maybe some of the great uh, comments and wisdom and share it with your family, uh, it will be uh, available on our website, cbfp.ca. OMG. Okay, cbfp.com. That's why I can never see what's on the website. Uh, cbfp.com. Uh, they're going to fire me after tonight. Hey, thanks everyone. Thanks for the great questions and super interaction. It, it makes it fun for all of us. Uh, have a good night.